Hi and welcome to Midnight Cry. I'm your host, Ramal Gassane, and today we have with us Jay Smith, who will be discussing with us a little bit more about the life of Muhammad. First of all, welcome to the show, Jay. Hey, it's good to be here. Now, I've been finding these episodes so interesting. I'm learning so much, and I'm sure that our viewers would be learning so much, and I'll be challenged by a lot of the things that you say. And I want to ask you, just before we get into this segment, what, is, what are your thoughts towards Muslims? I mean, are you saying this, are you doing these things because you hate Muslims? Do you oh, hate Muslims? Absolutely. Now, how could you hate Muslims? I just love that passion. I've been working with them for 30 years. <laughs> I don't know why everybody doesn't want to work with Muslims. Not only do they have a passion for what they believe, they absolutely, uh, I've never, I, rarely do I ever see a Muslim who doesn't believe that Allah is God or the mm. Quran is the word of God or that Muhammad is the prophet of God. And uh, they're willing to die for it, a lot of them. And yes. I, I'm jealous of that passion. No, I don't yes. hate Muslims at all. The problem I have is not with the Muslims. The problem I have with, is with this book. Mm. And more specifically, uh, I have the prob well, a problem with the man behind this book, Muhammad. And that's why we're doing this series on Muhammad. Well, just on that note, a lot of Muslims come up to me, often when we're talking about, you know, Muhammad, him being a prophet, and they say to me, did you know that Muhammad can be found in the Old Testament yeah. in the Bible? Yeah. Have you ever had that? I get it all the time. And you can see why, Rommel, why they have to say this. When you stop and ask yourself if, if everything they believe comes from one man, is dependent on that one man, it's all on his shoulders, where does his authority come from? Yes. And so they have to look outside of himself, because if, if he himself gives himself his own authority, that's not much of an authority. I could say that I'm a prophet, you could say you're a prophet, but you need something outside that gives you that. When you look at Jesus Christ, there are so many prophecies in the Old Testament referring to him. Over 300 prophecies refer to who he was, who, when he would come, how he would come, what town he would be born in, how he would die, between who he would die, even where he was going to be buried. There are so many specific prophecies that point to just that one man. Yes. Where is there one prophecy about Muhammad? More than that, the Quran says so. The Quran is very clear that they will find this prophet in their own scriptures. Now let's go put up the verses on the screen and you'll see what it's referring to. You need to go back to Surah 7, Ayah 157 which says, those who can follow the messenger, the prophet who you can neither read, who can neither read nor write, whom they find written with them in the Taurat, in the Injil. So here's a prophet who neither reads nor writes. Every Muslim knows or assumes that Muhammad could not need, uh, read or write. So this must be referring to Muhammad. That's Surah 7, Ayah 157. Surah 61, Ayah 6 says, and when Issa, son of Mary, said, O children of Israel, I am the messenger of Allah unto you, confirming the Taurat, which is the Torah as we know it, before me, and giving glad tidings of a messenger to come after me, whose name shall be Ahmad. Ahmad. Now, Ahmad is a diminutive for Muhammad. So they've got to find a prophet who, doesn't need or, who, can, who does not read or write, who is found in the Taurat, which is the Torah, and in the Injil, which is the Gospel. So that's both in the Old and the New Testament. Yes. If you want to get specific, that's the books of Moses and the New Testament, the Gospels and his name would be Ahmad. So they got to find that name. And there have been hundreds upon hundreds of videos up on YouTube where they reference after reference that they go to. And what I, there's so many that have come up now that we don't have time to go through all of them. I want to go through three of them in specific, three ones that are probably the most popular. And I want to go primarily, let's go through uh, the, the ones in the Old Testament to begin with. Let's go to Deuteronomy 18. So okay. if you have your Bible, let's open yep. up to Deuteronomy 18. And I, I would encourage anybody who is watching this also to open up Deuteronomy 18. Uh, they usually go to verse 15 and verse 18, which say the exact same thing. And let me just read it to you from Deuteronomy 18, verse 15, which says, The Lord your God will raise up for you a prophet like me. That's usually where they stop. They only don't want to read beyond that for one very good reason. If you read what happens after that, it says, From among your own brothers. Mm. If they'd only read the whole verse, they would see. A prophet like me, this is Moses speaking, so it has to be a prophet like Moses. I know Ahmadita did a very famous uh, speech where he says, who is this man like Moses? Well, Moses had a beard, Jesus had a beard. Moses had a wife, Jesus had a wife. Uh, Jesus did not have a wife, so Muhammad had a wife. Yes. Let's get it back again, let's re return that. Moses had a beard, Muhammad had a beard. We don't know if Jesus did or not, probably he did as well. <laughs> Moses had a wife, Jesus did not have a wife, but Muhammad did. Moses had an exodus. He went, uh, brought the people out of Egypt, had the exodus. 
Muhammad had an exodus called the Hijrah. That's what Hijrah means in Arabic, from Mecca to Medina. Moses created laws, had the Ten Commandments, was a man who instituted new laws. So did Muhammad create new laws. What laws did Jesus create? Moses created a people and created a whole state, a theocratic state. So did Muhammad create a theocratic state. What state did, Muhammad, uh, did Jesus create? No rules, regulations, no government. In fact, he uh, separated church and state. So therefore, this must mean Muhammad because it has so many parallels. But they're not even stopping to ask, what does this mean? Just read the next part because it's very clear. It says in verse 15 and in verse 18, from among your brothers. So this will be a prophet like you from among your brothers. Now, what does that mean? Well, let's go back to chapter 17, verse 15. Chapter 17, verse 15 uh, uh, says, Be sure to appoint over you the king the Lord your God chooses. He must be from among your own brothers. So there is the same reference point, from among your own brothers. Do not place a foreigner over you, one who is not a brother Israelite. Mm. So from amongst your own people, he must be an Israelite. Yes. Is Muhammad an Israelite? No. Bingo. You've got a problem there. Mm -hmm. So this cannot be Muhammad because the very second half of the verse eradicates that, that possibility. But I don't want to stop there. I want to continue reading on. So come back with me to Deuteronomy 18 and then continue on with verse 19. Okay. If anyone does not listen to my words that the prophet, that means this prophet that we're talking about, speaks in my name. What name are we talking about? Look at verse, uh, certainly you can look at verse 17. The Lord said, L-O-R-D, capital letters, is Yahweh, in my name. That means has to speak in the name of Yahweh. Did Muhammad speak in the name of Yahweh? Never. We so already spoke about we that. We already yes. talked about that. So it's obviously, that can't be Muhammad. I myself will call him to account. Verse 20, and here's where the real clincher is. But a prophet who presumes to speak in my name anything I have not commanded him to say, or a prophet who speaks in the name of other gods, not Yahweh. What's the name that Muhammad uses? Allah. The God, generic, mm -hmm. pre-Islamic pagan God. What must we do? Must be put to death. Wow. We must put Muhammad to death. Wow. As hard as that is for Muslims to hear, if they're going to use Deuteronomy 18, verse 15 and 18, don't just stop with verse 18. Read the next three verses, 19 and 20, and look at the application of what we're supposed to do. If they want to believe that that's Muhammad, then we need to put Muhammad to death. It condemns I've him. I've got to come back to the Bible. Yes. The Bible condemns it. And that's why it's, it's a safeguard for me. Now, Muslims will go to all kinds of other references. I, it's fascinating to me. They go to anything, uh, any verse that uh, refers to a sword. I've heard Muslims claim um, Psalm 45, I, verses 2 to 5. A man that has the wheels of the sword, verse 149, Isaiah chapter 63, where anybody wielding a sword it must be referring to Muhammad. That's rather tertiary. They talk about uh, geographical locations such as in Deuteronomy 33, 2, or Isaiah 21, and specifically Isaiah 42. I've heard many people, Adnan Rashid likes to take Isaiah 42 because it talks about Kedad, and Kedad is in Arabia, therefore it must be Muhammad because he is from Kedad, without realizing that if you're going to go back to Isaiah 42, just read the first five verses of Isaiah 42, and the first four, four verses, and it's very clear that this is referring to Jesus Christ. In fact, in Matthew chapter 12, verse 15 to 21, it is fulfilled in Matthew 12. It's very clear that Matthew 12 is referring back to Isaiah 42, mm -hmm. that this is specifically talking about Jesus Christ, not Muhammad. They like to go to anything that, um, uh, like Genesis 49, verse 8 to 10, uh, talks about Judah. They refer, re reference that as referring back to Muhammad, or where there is a name like Hemdan or Mahmud. And the one Muhammad we need to look at, because that's the one they like to point to in, in Song of Solomon 5, 16, chapter 5, verse 16. The word Muhammad comes up there. And they, I hear a lot of Muslims that like to point to that as must be Muhammad, because that is close to Ahmad. So this Muhammad. is in the Arabic you're talking about? Well, Arabic it's Ahmad, in Hebrew it's Muhammad. Mm -hmm. Muhammad sounds like Ahmad, does it not? Mm, yes. So there is the <laughs> alliance, but also it means much the same thing, glorious one. Mm -hmm. And so they go to, uh, Song of Solomon, chapter 5, verse 16, which says this. His mouth is sweetness itself. He is altogether lovely. Lovely. That means Mahmud. That's the word. This is my lover. This is my friend, O daughters of Jerusalem. So what they would say, they would take out Ahmad or Mahmud and put Ahmad in there. So they would read it then. His mouth is sweetness itself. He is altogether Muhammad, or he is Muhammad. This is my lover, this is my friend, O daughters of Jerusalem. Now, altogether lovely is 
is an adjectival phrase. Ahmed is a proper noun, the glorious one. Mm. So they've taken an adjectival phrase and replaced it with a proper noun. Can you do that? Grammatically speaking, you can't. Uh -huh. <laughs> but more than that, just look at the context here. He is altogether lovely. This is my lover. This is my friend. Oh, daughters. Was Muhammad ever in Jerusalem? No. So that completely eradicates him as far as the context for that. But when you lo go through that, you can see that there are other references. When you stop and ask, if you're going to take Muhammad and replace it with Ahmad in Song of Solomon 5.16, then you've got to do that wherever Muhammad is found. And there are 11 other references. Let me just read them for you. In 2 Chronicles chapter 36, 19, Isaiah chapter 64, verse 11, in Lamentations chapter 1, verse 10, and also verse 11, in Lamentations chapter 2, verse 4, in Ezekiel chapter 24, verse 16, also verse 21, also verse 25, in Hosea chapter 9, verse 6, also verse 16, in Joel chapter 3, verse 5, and most specifically in 1 King chapter 20, verse 6, you will find Mahmud repeated over and over and over again. If you're going to do it in Song of Solomon 5, 16, you've got to go to every one of those references in the Old Testament and replace it. You've got to be consistent. But just, let's, let's just take 1 Kings chapter 20 and verse 16, and look what happens when you take Mahmud out and put Ahmad in its place, okay, yeah. or Muhammad in its place. It then becomes, yet I will send my servant to thee tomorrow about this time, and they shall search thy house and the houses of thy servants, and it shall be that whatever is Muhammad in thy eyes, they shall take it in their hand and carry it away. I mean, it's almost laughable. It becomes ridiculous. Yes. You can't do that. You don't do that to Scripture. If you're going to take it out and replace it in one place, you've got to do it all the way across. Yes. Now, had the author of Song of Solomon's, chapter 5, 5, verse 16, had wanted to put a proper noun in there, there is a proper noun that he could have used. Hemdan is the Hebrew equivalent for Ahmad. But the, uh, the author didn't need Hemdan. Mm. Altogether lovely is all he needed. That's right. So that pretty much eradicates any reference to Muhammad in Song of Solomon. What about the New Testament? Now where they go to there is they go to John, chapter 14, and John chapter 16, more specifically John chapter 14, verse 16, and John chapter 16, verse 7. And you know what I'm talking about. This is the Parakletos. This is the Holy Spirit. Parakletos is the name for the Comforter. And when Jesus leaves, He says, I'm leaving you, but I'm sending with you. I'm leaving behind the Comforter. What the Muslims do is they take that word Parakletos, and we, to transliterate it into English, it's P-A-R-A-K-L-E-T-O-S. That's how we would write it out in English. And they take those four vowels out and replace it with perikletos, P-E-R-I-K-L-Y-T-O-S. So they put a whole different set of vowels. Okay. They take out the four that are there and put a whole... Mm -hmm. Can you do that to Greek? No. Nah. No. See, what they've misconstrued is they assume that Greek is like Hebrew and is like Arabic. In Hebrew yes. and Arabic, you only have a consonantal text. And you put the vowels in there as you want. The vowels aren't written, so you can include whatever vowels you want to. You can't do that with the Greek because in the Greek, the vowels are always placed in the text itself. Hmm. So you can't just lift out the vowels and imply your own vowels. Because hmm. if that were the case, then of course that would have been done in the manuscript evidence. And we have a good 230 manuscripts of the New Testament, many of them of the Gospel of John. In fact, we have a reference to the Gospel uh, uh, of John all the way back to the second century. But here's the funny thing. I, I don't know of any Gospel of John that has Perikletos in it. Every Gospel of John that we have in Greek, always have perikletos, yes. which is comforter. Even, as, even if you were to suggest that maybe we, the, the, the manuscript evidence is wrong, let's just look at the context. Read the verses that come after. And what you will find in chapter 14, verse 16, it says, He will be with you forever. In verse 17, He will be the Spirit of truth. That gives the definition right there. Who is this we're talking about? The Spirit of truth. Mm. The Spirit of truth is with us forever. Is Muhammad with us forever? No. No, Muhammad has dead gone, long gone. But the Spirit of truth is still with us, is it not? Yes. Continuing on in verse 17, the world neither sees him. No, we can't see the Holy Spirit. But did we see Muhammad? Did we yes. see Muhammad? Certain yes. people saw him. I know you can't put him in a movie, and I know you can't put yeah. a picture on him, but certainly the world did see him at one time. And then also, uh, verse 7, he says, no one knows him. Certainly some people knew Muhammad. Mm -hmm. Otherwise, how do we know so much about him? Yes. Do we know the Holy Spirit? No. no. And then most importantly, and he will be in you. <laughs> God forbid, Muhammad inside me? He just makes me <laughs> shee -shee -shee all over. No, that can't refer to Muhammad. Those applications are very clear. 
Only the Holy Spirit we don't see. Only the Holy Spirit, we know He's with us. He's in us at all times. Thank God He is, because that keeps me on the straight and narrow. And it's such a weak attempt. I mean, you can't just cherry pick from Scripture and replace a word for another word or vows for another vow. You, you can't do that. No. You have to look at the context. It has to make sense. So what is uh, uh, Jesus speaking to about here? What is He referring to here? Well, it's very clear that this is the Holy Spirit that comes 50 days later in Acts chapter 1, verse 4 and 5. We see the fulfillment of that when the Holy Spirit does come in power at the day of Pentecost. Mm. That's what Jesus is referring to. It's the Holy Spirit that comes 50 days later, infills the, the disciples at that time. He is in them. That's not a problem. And we know that we can trust that because the Holy Spirit is still here. That's right. Not Muhammad. Yes. Yes. I mean, any person that would read uh, the gospel accounts unaided with that thought would never come to that conclusion no. that the comforter is Muhammad. I mean, someone has to make that assertion yeah. and then believe it. Yeah. Now, we, we want to end with Muhammad, but before we do, we want to end with one more thing, and that is the Danish cartoons. I think we've got to uh, end with that because that caused such a huge furore around the world. The Danish cartoons in 2005, these 12 cartoons, I don't know if you've seen them, but they were put uh, in this Danish uh, publication uh, called Gillen's Postent uh, as a joke, really as a, uh, a mockery, uh, which in the West they do all the time. They mock Jesus Christ. Uh, uh, certainly a lot of our great leaders are mocked, and Muhammad was going to be mocked as well. They, uh, put together these 12 innocent cartoons and that didn't cause a huge furore. I remember uh, if you look in Egypt, uh, the uh, Al Fajr newspaper actually ran one of the pictures on the cover uh, in October 17, 2005 of Muhammad with the bomb in his turban. So that was run in the front of the, of the of a Egyptian newspaper, a Muslim newspaper, and it was really run as a joke to show what the Danish were doing. But there was no outcry against it. No outcry against it. So why did this outcry happen? Interestingly, in Denmark, there was a, 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 a imam known Ab Ahmad Abu Laban was his name. He was a cleric there in Copenhagen, and he saw these twelve cartoons, was incensed by them, and was curious as to why there had not been an outcry among amongst the Muslim world. So he decided to do something about it. So he went in 2005, he went to Al-Azhar University there in Cairo. Uh, he went also to Qatar to meet Yusuf Qaradawi, the cleric there who's on Al Jazeera every night to show him these pictures. And then he also went to Jeddah in Saudi Arabia to show the officials there. But he didn't just go with these 12 cartoons. We're gonna show on the screen three other cartoons that he added to that. And you look at those three cartoons and they're heinous, they're hideous. One of them, as you can see there on the left, is a picture of Muhammad holding two children in either hand as if uh, saying that he's a pedophile. Another one has a picture of a, of a, a human with a head of a, of, a, of a pig, squealing like a pig and saying this is Muhammad. And the third one is probably the most uh, problematic, shows a picture of Muhammad praying with a dog um, having sex with him from behind. I mean, you can see if that were of Muhammad, course. that would cause enormous amount of anger. So where were these pictures from? Well, that's, all, that's the million dollar question. It was when they looked at these three pictures, these three pictures uh, that were put alongside the 12, that the Muslims got angered. Mm. And assuming that they were the, also the pictures that the Danish cartoons, cartoonists had put together. When you look at them, you see they were am amateurish. Yes. The Danish government never said anything about it. In fact, the Danish government never ran this down because they were so concerned with their economy that if there was gonna be a boycott against all their goods, they didn't want this to be a problem, so they condemned the, the 12 cartoons, but never ran down these three cartoons. It was Time magazine that decided to find out where these three cartoons came through, and they went to Sheikh Abdul Laban and asked him if he had made these. And of course, he denied it vociferously. And then they did a little bit of research, and they found that the picture of the uh, head of a pig on, on Muhammad was not about Muhammad at all. It actually came from an August 15th uh, picture from 2005 of a photo of a man named Jacques Barreau competing in the annual French pig squealing championship in three sur base in France. Wow. It was a pig squealing contest by French pig farmers. And the man they have pictured there, if you look carefully, you can see that there is a microphone right down by his mouth. He's squealing yes. into a microphone, trying to squeal like a pig. Had nothing to do with Muhammad. This had to do with pig farmers. Mm. Interestingly, the man that they have pictured there didn't even win the contest. He came third place. 
proving that this Sheikh Abu Laban lifted this picture out of a uh, farming magazine, put it together with the other two that he probably created himself, and then suggested that they were part of these 12 that were done in How this sad. James Rowland. Huge How sad. deception. I mean, he is supposed to be a spiritual leader for his people, and he's deceiving them. Until this day. Now, he's died, but until this day, no one has more, uh, dared to go and confront him with that. Mm. And I think that's sad. That fear that we have in Europe. But here's the problem. Why is it that this caused so much anger? And uh, I remember I went around to Trafalgar Square and I went down to talk to people who were writing against us and demonstrating. And I went to the, I asked quite a few Muslims, why does this cause you so much anger? And they said, Muhammad is as close to me as my brother. Muhammad is as close to me as my father. You do not mock our prophet like this. And I started to realize I can see what was causing this anger. See, Muslims don't have anybody that's close to them like we have with Jesus Christ. We know that Jesus is God on earth. Yes. We know that he has a relationship with us. Where do Muslims go for that relationship? Where do Muslims go to find somebody that is as close to them that as Jesus is with us? They, they don't. They can't go to Allah? Allah is distant. Allah is totally other. Allah never even comes to earth. Mm. Our God comes to earth anytime he wants and has done so right through history. We have what they don't have. No wonder they elevate Muhammad to such an extent. They have to Muhammad elevate him because they have nothing like we have. And I say to my Muslim friends, and I say this and I implore with you, listen, you cannot replace Jesus with Muhammad. As much as you would like, Muhammad will never suffice. Yes. Muhammad will never do what Jesus can do. And probably that's the best way to end off this whole series on Muhammad. Yes. You can see they've elevated Muhammad to such a height they need someone that's like Jesus. They need God who comes to them and walks and talks to them. A God who enters time and space. A God that they can relate to. A God who, yes, has, has suffered like the, we have suffered. Muhammad mm. is the closest they can get. No wonder we, they won't let us touch him. No wonder we must not mock him. You yes. can mock Jesus all you want. You can pin him to the cross. You can put him on the cross. And what will Jesus do in response? Father, forgive them, for they know not what they do. What an example we have. Yes, what a wonderful example. Yes, most certainly. Those who want to go to Muhammad, please don't waste your time with Muhammad. Come back mm. to Jesus. He's all you need. And I say that and I implore that to you. I can understand why you need to try to find him in our scriptures. I can understand why you think that he's the greatest paradigm for all of mankind, the greatest model, but he comes nothing close to Jesus Christ. Even in your Quran, we have seen that Jesus is superior to your Muhammad. It's obvious to me that there's only one man that we can really give allegiance to. Only one man who was God on earth. That's right. His name is Jesus. Yes. We don't need Muhammad. Yes. We need Jesus. Yes. And I mean, just as you were talking, I was just thinking about this, is that even though he is mocked, let's assume that these pictures, though they were untrue, let's assume they were true. God would know. Mm. God doesn't need anyone to defend him. God would judge these people. I mean, it just... It never ceases to amaze me why people need to somehow defend God. Mm -hmm. If God is all-powerful, all-sovereign, yeah. yeah. He can defend Himself. Mm -hmm. I mean, yes, you, it, it upsets you, but because my understanding is, is that there were some people that actually died as a result of that, yeah. and they didn't even produce those pictures. Mm -hmm. Is that right? Yeah. Wow. Come on home. Yes. Well, it's been great to be able to talk about Muhammad. But after all is said and done, it really comes back to Jesus Christ. Mm. He is, really is the paradigm for today, for every day, for everyone, everywhere. Yes. Jay, thank you for your time. Hey, thank you. It's been great. We really hope that you've been able to see for yourself the truth behind Jesus and the truth behind Muhammad. I really hope and pray that you would think about this deeply. This is a really important question for you to find some answers for. Please stay in tune with the very next episode of Midnight Cry. May God bless you.